When you see anyone getting their floors done with fancy wood, you should always ask for the scraps. These two pieces are African mahogany tongue and groove, and I thought these would be perfect for today's project. You can get more out of two pieces of thin wood than you can imagine. You just have to be creative. I thought I would start out by drawing the display. I measured a golf ball and it's a little under two inches. So I will go with the three inches for each display shelf. However many shelves I end up with, I will just multiply that by three. So with five or six shelves, I will probably go with about 18 inches. That should give me enough to play with. The first thing I have to do, because I am working with flooring, is cut off the tongue and groove. So that's what I'm doing here. This will give me a normal looking board. We're going to do that to both pieces. So I measured out 18 inches and then made my first cut. Then I realized that I did not have measurements for the length of each shelf. So I made a command decision to go ahead and cut four pieces at 18 inches, which would give me eight pieces once I ripped them in half. The last leftover piece I could make for the top and the bottom. And maybe the last bit I could use as a headpiece on the very top. Yes, I made this up on the fly. And you can even see me pause when I'm looking at it thinking, what am I going to do? And I can get away with this. Why? Yes, because I make this up as I go along. When looking at it all, after I'd cut it, I thought to myself, that if I rip the very top piece to match the rest, I will actually have a little bit of wood left over. So this is working out better than I thought. So at this point, I was going to rip them in half, but I was really unhappy with the grooves on the bottom of each board. So I thought I would cut those off first, and then with, with the width I had left over after ripping them, I would cut those perfectly in half. Okay, so if you are a subscriber, you know I love all those little gadgets that make measuring easier. You know, the ones that say with the catchphrase, taking the woodworking industry by storm, or this simple tool is putting professionals out of business. Yeah, I am a sucker for those. Well, here's a simple tool that helps you find the center of any board. And as you can see me trying to use it, it doesn't work. But you need to find a pencil or pen that fits the center tightly, and that's not easy. I found a mechanical pencil, but the lead keeps breaking when I try to mark with it. The second issue is if you can get it to mark, you can't mark on the edge of the board where you need to align the blade when you're lining up to cut it. It kind of defeats the purpose. You will need to make your marks in the center of the board and then use another tool to draw out your lines. And as you can see, I eventually gave, gave up on the centering tool and I used a small T-scribe. I swear, I could make a whole video out of these quick gadget tools because I think I have them all. Once I marked the center of each board, I set my bandsaw blade and I cut all my pieces. So after this step, I should have a total of 12 thin pieces to work with. My next step was to sand the boards. It will be easier to sand them before we put anything together. So let's sand them now while we can lay everything flat and make it easy. Remember that the other side of each piece already has a professional hardened clear coat that is used to protect the floor, because remember these were two pieces of flooring. I will leave that in place and only sand the sides that were cut by the bandsaw. After you are finished sanding, you can wipe each piece down with a damp cloth. Ensure that you remove any excess dust from your sanding. Then, just use teak oil to bring the glow of the wood back out. Before we go to the next step, ensure you give ample time for your teak oil to dry. And then, you are going to cover each piece with polyurethane. Now, I have my favorite, which is Verithane Triple Thick Polyurethane. This stuff is great, and when I made my coffee table many years ago, I used it. And as luck would have it, I was out. So I pulled out some standard water-based semi-gloss polyurethane. If you're wondering why this stuff is in a Gatorade bottle, well, it's another little trick I use to keep my poly from drying up. 
if you don't get that lid back on perfect, well, the next time you go to poly something is probably the time you'll find out that it dried up. So just pour it in a Gatorade bottle and you will always be able to see how much you have left and see that it's still good. So what I am doing here is deciding which two pieces will be my two outside pieces or walls. The rest will be shelves. I pick my two prettiest pieces based on the grain of the wood and I pull them out so I can mark them up for the slots that I will make. Earlier I think that I said I wanted each shelf to have about three inches of space but when I measured this out it looked too big and knowing that the balls are just a little bit bigger than an inch and a half I decided to measure out two and a quarter instead. With my new measurement I mark both planks at the same time then I take a board and use it across both planks and mark that and from that mark I repeat again at two and a quarter inch. I do this all the way across the board. Now if it does not end up perfect, I can cut the sides to the desired width. Yeah, I'm still making this up as I go along. Now to make sure each slot is the exact width of my planks, I pull out my dados and I put a piece on its side and I simply stack up the blades until I get the exact height of the board. Now later you will see that sanding has made, a, made some of these boards a bit smaller, but it will be manageable. So now with my blades set, I am going to cut each slot half the width of the board. I use my miter gauge and I stack both pieces side by side, ensuring that they are flush on the edge. And then I just run each slot across the blade where I marked it. When you are finished, each slot should be exact on each board. At this point, I am trying to find out what would look best for ball spacing. I start by finding the center of the board and then using a piece of scrap wood, I place more balls on to see what distance between the balls looks best. My third attempt and change of scrap wood gave me my best spacing. So I mark under the first and second ball get the exact measurement between the two and then continue that out to the last ball. So if you are following along, you get to learn from my mistakes. At this point, you need to make all of these shelves a quarter of an inch shorter in width. I completely forgot to do this. This is so your back plate sets into the frame. You know I don't edit out my mistakes and I got caught up trying to make the balls have their best appearance so I wasn't paying attention. But I will show you when I realize I screwed up later in the video and how I fixed it. So after my marks are in place, I use a ruler and just align the two outer dots and mark all the boards quickly. I will use a ball nose bit here just to give a bit of convex so each ball will stay snug. I pull out my drill press table so I can do this rapidly and every socket will be identical. The table has a fence and this will allow me to set the depth of each concave spot and make them all exact as I run through these boards. I just align each dot on the board under the bit, set my fence and the fence stop and run each board through until each board has the exact concave portion. Don't forget to set your drill stop before you begin so all of your depths are the same. So earlier I said that making the shelves all the same distance apart would be easy because you will be able to cut the last or the end of each one to size. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm cutting the end so the top and bottom will match the rest of the distance of the shelves. Now we are at that step that will make the box look like it's finally taking form. Lay out all your pieces and place glue in your slots. Have a couple of clamps at the ready so you can keep things from falling apart on you and you can apply pressure until the glue sets. Before you let this sit, make sure it is square by checking your angles. Then clean up any excess glue with a paper towel and let it sit for a while. It was at this point that I decided to make a change. I knew this was going on a wall, but if it were ever to be placed on a table or a desk, I felt that the thin bottom was just not enough weight to act as the base. Also, with the heavier base, it will look a bit more balanced. So remember when I said earlier in this video that we would make this box from these two pieces of wood? 
Well, scratch that, you need three. So while I decide to contemplate a little more on the base, I move on to the topper. I find the center of both boards, I mark them, and then I align them. Having the face board a little closer to the front edge of the board and mark the spot I think looks best. With a router, I choose a bit that is the same width as the boards. I do this by lying the bit on its side next to the board. Then I simply run that bit between the marks that I just made for the face board. Since the bit is round, the ends do not square when you make your cut. So I take a chisel and I just square off the very ends of each line until the faceplate fits snugly. Now to give the faceplate a bit of a design. I will just take a protractor and a sharpie and I will make this up with a few curves. Nothing too extravagant. Just make it look a little better than a square or a rounded square. Remember to not cut the base shorter or you will have the groove show where you just managed to make it fit tight. Use a tape measure with your protractor to ensure that your placement is exact on both ends when making your curves. If you think that this will be too hard, just draw it out on a piece of paper and then when you're happy, cut it out just half of it and then fold it back in half to make sure both sides are exact. Then just lay it over your faceplate and trace the shape directly onto it. Now that I've had some time to give the base some thought, I have decided to go with an extra 2 inches on each end. So if all the shelves are 18 inches, I will make my board 22 inches long. That will allow me 2 inches of overhang on each side. At this point, I am leaving the tongue and groove on the board. The groove will be to the back so no one will see it anyway, and the tongue is kind of fancy and will be used at the front. So after cutting, place your rack on top of the base, make sure it's centered, and then use the same process you did before and cut a slot in the board to fit the base and the rack together. I will do the same with these slots. I simply clamp down a few pieces of wood to help guide my router, and I set the depth to little more than one eighth of an inch. The extra boards on each side are just to ensure the router does not tip. When checking that my slots fit the rack, I took a dislike to the tongue on the board, and it was at this point I decided to cut it off, so that's exactly what I did. I just ran it across the table saw. Yes, I truly am making this up as I go along, so please don't ask for building plans. Heck, I can't even remember what I ate for breakfast. And since I forgot to turn the camera on, I am reenacting the event for your viewing pleasure. Before you go and attach the base, don't forget to go back to the drill press and drill out your pockets for your golf balls. There is no reason the base can't be used as a shelf as well, and this can get you an extra 8 balls added to your rack. Take your faceplate and cut out your design. You can use a jigsaw here, but my bandsaw is already out and it makes quick work of this piece. The next step is to cut your backplate. So while laying a piece down to see if it would fit, this is when I noticed my error, and of course this would not be a typical John's do-it-yourself if I did not screw something up. Yes, I forgot to cut the shelves a quarter inch shorter than the sides so the back plate would fit snugly in between. So what I did was pulled out my dados and I set the height of my saw blade to a quarter of an inch. Then I just ran the rack over the blade being careful not to make contact with the sides. After I had all the shelves cut, I went back and sanded the burrs and made it real smooth. Now that my back plate fits inside the sides, I can place the top and bottom pieces in place and draw the exact fit for the back plate directly onto the back plate. Now that I have cut off the tongue of the board, I have decided to round the edges. This will give it a smoother flowing look. I take a couple of objects to see what would give me the best roundness and then I simply trace around the object. I only cut the front two corners. The back two will remain flush up against the wall when it's hung, so I want to leave them be. Then I do a quick sanding job to ensure my round cuts are smooth. My last step with the base is to give it a fancy edge. Yes, I know I just cut away the tongue, but it didn't look fancy enough to me. This will look much better than the tongue. So I take it to the router and I run it through one time. 
and then all that is left is a few burrs that can be cleaned up with a light hand sanding. Now we can attach our base and our top piece. Simply place some glue into the slots and then clamp them together. Now for the faceplate. You can leave this blank or you can glue on an emblem or even a coin to represent your golfing memories. I have decided to just burn a golf logo onto the faceplate with my laser. Lay a quick bead of glue in the groove of your top piece and press in your faceplate. If you want, you can use a few extra clamps to apply more pressure until it is dry. I take the tongue that I had cut off the base and I use it to add just a little more flair. This will also hide any inconsistencies in your slotted groove on the top if you made any. I make this piece the same length as the top piece, mark it, and then I cut it to fit and then I just glue it in place and with a few spring clamps I just clamp it down. With some spray adhesive I spray the back plate and then I just lay down some felt and smooth it out. My son wanted garnet instead of the forest green I had, and I was okay with this because I like different. I take it over to the workbench and I just flip it over, and then I just trim away the excess felt. With the back plate being cut to fit, the felt over the edges will make it really tight. You can just press it into the box. This way, if you ever want to change the color, you can pop it out and apply new felt. Now, if you are fine with your color and never plan on changing it, you can simply put a few drops of wood glue on the back, and when it dries, it'll be secure. The last step is to add your balls and hang on your wall. And that's it, your very own personally made golf display. What do you think? Would you have gone with the garnet or stayed with the golf green backing? Let me know in the comments. As always, Thanks for watching and hit that subscribe button.